Revelation chapter 2, please, in your Bibles this morning. The book of the Revelation and chapter 2. We are in the letters to the seven churches. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is primarily a revelation of a person, Christ, the Son of God. It's a revelation of His glory. It's a revelation of His work. It's a revelation of His purpose. It's a revelation of His sovereignty. It's a revelation of His will to His people. It is a revelation of Christ. We know in the opening words of this book that it is the revelation of Christ for His people. This is a book for believers. While it is used many, many thousands of times to bring unbelievers to a knowledge of the gospel and to faith in Jesus Christ, yet its primary purpose is not for the unbeliever. Its primary purpose is for the believer. It is to show his servants the things that must soon come to pass. Now, let's not forget that it is also a message for unbelievers, for the book concludes with this wonderful invitation, the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, and the Bride, that is God's children through faith in Christ, the church. The Spirit and the Bride say to the unbeliever, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who is thirsty come. Whoever is willing, let him come and take the free gift of the water of life. That means come and receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. So the book of the Revelation is in that sense for the unbeliever, it is an invitation. But for the believer, it is an exhortation. For the believer, it is an exhortation to be ready because his coming can be at any moment. We await his coming in two ways. We await his coming in this sense. We don't know how many more days God will give us. My wife's dad was just diagnosed with stage four extensive bone cancer. Uh, he's only given a very short time to live, and that's why Valerie and our daughter Janelle are there this weekend. They're driving back now. But they drove down Friday because as the pain medication increases, the likelihood of being able to communicate is thereby diminished. So they had a wonderful uh, day with him yesterday and had a lengthy conversation and sang hymns and prayed together. And uh, we don't know if they'll get that opportunity again in this life, but we all know that our days are numbered. My days right now are 21,422. As many of you know, I write that down every morning, what day it is. God has given me 21,422 days. I don't know how many more he's going to give me. But one thing's for sure, he's got them numbered. He's got them numbered. And so we look forward to seeing him face to face if he calls us through the valley of the shadow of death. And we don't know how many days he's assigned to us. The other thing we wait for is his return. As the old hymn writer said, O oh joy, O oh delight, should I go without dying. No sorrow, no sickness, no groaning, no crying, caught up in the clouds with my Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own. We also anticipate that. But either way, we must be ready. And so the book of the Revelation exhorts us to be ready, to live in the light of his soon and sudden presence. Now, in the first letter, in chapter 2 to the church at Ephesus, we saw that they were strong on work, strong on persevering through suffering, strong on truth, and strong on purity. Four of the five things that are addressed in the seven letters to the seven churches, the church at Ephesus was strong in. They were strong on their work for Christ. We find this in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. They were strong on persevering through suffering. They were strong on discerning the truth of the gospel and reject, rejecting false teaching. And they were strong on remaining pure morally in their walk with Christ and their witness to a world. But where they were weak was love for Christ. And so Jesus rebukes them. And why does Christ rebuke us? As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. It is always the love of Christ that motivates even the harshest of warnings to his people. Never forget that. 
I read early this morning in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, my son, do not despise the chastening or the discipline of the Lord. Don't despise it when God rebukes you and convicts you of sin. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor become discouraged when He rebukes you, because whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. And so we see discipline in these letters, not because Jesus is irritated with us, but because He loves us. We saw last week the second church, the church at Smyrna, receives no rebuke. They were a church that was consumed with suffering. And so they received from Christ a ready word of encouragement to not give up in a long season of suffering. And now today we want to look at the next two churches, the church at Pergamum and the church at Thyatira. We're putting these together because the situations in those churches are very similar, very similar. There are some distinctions, but they are extremely similar. And so we're going to look at both of them together and take the warnings and the encouragements that we find therein. The church at Pergamum, read along with me if you will, follow along, Revelation chapter 2 beginning in verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write... These are the words of him. And never forget, it starts each time this way. These are the actual, genuine, exact words of Christ. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. A double-edged sword was a Roman fighting sword. It was not to be put on display. It was to be used in the heat of the battle. And the idea is it would cut no matter which way the soldier was swinging it. It was lethal, doubly lethal, if you will. It was a fighting weapon and fearful. This says here that these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Well, what is that referring to? Well, come a little farther, and you'll come over to verse 16, and we read these words, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We are reminded of another passage, are we not? Over in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, which says the Word of God, say it with me, the Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner or a judge of the thoughts and motives of the heart. When it speaks here of Jesus being the one with a double-edged sword, the sword that comes out of his mouth, is that this is the word of the one who will judge with his word his servants. And it is a word that will pierce deeply you see, all that a human sword can do is separate the soul from the body through death. But what this sword searches is the thoughts and motives of the heart. No human sword can pierce that deeply. No human sword can discern the motives of why people do what they do or the thoughts. You've all heard the old saying, well, they can't hang you for what you're thinking. But there is one who judges what you're thinking and will reward those thoughts, at least those thoughts that are agreed with. I don't know where some of our thoughts come from. But the question is whether I embrace those thoughts or reject them. If they are holy thoughts, let me embrace them. If they are ungodly thoughts, let me fight against them. As the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, to bring every thought captive to Christ, to go to war with the sword of His Spirit and bring every thought captive. Now, this one who is revealed is the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword, the one who is going to take action. This is the point of it. He's going to take action on the basis of His infinite knowledge on the part of his people. Now, please understand, this is not a threat. 
I got this sword and you better listen. This is not a threat. This is an explanation of our sovereign Christ. He is the one who judges the thoughts and motives of every heart, and we better understand that. He tells us these things not because he's irritated with us, not because he wants to cause us to cower in fear, but because he wants us to know his sovereignty and our accountability because he loves us. He is the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword. And then he says this, I know where you live. Now, if you take this wrongly, it does sound like a threat. I know where you live. (laughs) But that's not what he's saying. What he's saying to us is, I know where you live. I know what your circumstances and situations are. I know what's going on around you. I know where you live. And that it's not an easy place. Have we ever thought in times of suffering and confusion, does he even know what's going on? He just doesn't seem to be doing anything. Does he know where I live? Is he aware of my address? Does he know what's happening? You see, he tells us, he does. I, I know, he says, where you live, where Satan has his throne. Now, what is this about? probably referring to temples, to idols, and Roman emperors and gods. Because in both of these cities, Pergamum and Thyatira, there was the emperor cult, and there were temples to various false gods. Asclepius was here in the city of Pergamum, a great temple. Uh, also to, uh, and, and that was the, uh, the god of uh, healing, where you have the the serpent on the pole, what we still use as an emblem today. It's the Greek god Asclepius of healing, or physicians, if you will, but it was a god that was worshipped, a false god. They also worshipped Augustus. His temple was in the city, the former Roman emperor. And so there was great pressure on the people of that day to go to these temples and worship. Now, it wasn't required by the Roman government, per se, but it was expected by the people of the cities and their trade guilds and their, uh, their trade and their income was dependent upon the comradeship of the community. And so they had their regular community worship at the temple to Augustus in which they would go in and they would offer incense and celebrate in a communal feast Caesar as Lord. And you were considered a traitor if you wouldn't do it. That you weren't a, you weren't, you weren't really a citizen. You weren't really a, a patriot. You were a turncoat, a traitor. disloyal. So there was great pressure to cooperate, to go along, because everybody was doing it. So if you want to get along, go along. You've heard that old saying. And so the pressure was to go to the temples, to offer the incense, to eat at the temple feasts. It's just all the neighbors are going. Everybody's going. They they don't mean anything by it. It's just something we do. And if we don't do it, then the likelihood is it'll affect our business, and people will start going elsewhere, and we'll get a bad name, and it'll have a deleterious effect on the pocketbook and on our how people look at us, and and you don't want to be a weirdo. You don't want to, you know, just be an outcast. If you want to get along, you got to go along. So there was this intense pressure to conform to the spirit of the age. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. And the temple of Augustus had a large throne, an image of the former Caesar. 
And the Lord Jesus here seems to be indicating that he understands that what's behind idolatry is the evil one. Now, on one hand, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we understand that idols are nothing, right? What's an idol? It's just a piece of stone or gold or whatever. It's nothing. And Paul says that. We know that an idol is nothing. There's only one true and living God. But Paul also reminds us, as does Christ, that behind all idolatry is Satan. Because it is his desire that anything be worshipped other than the true and living God. And while Paul says to eat meat offered to idols is not a big deal, to offer to an idol is a big deal. There's a distinction between living in the world and living like the world. We have to live in the world, but we are not to live like it. We are never to compromise the witness of Jesus Christ for the sake of getting along. Now, we ought not to be disagreeable people. And if the witness of Christ is rejected, it should not be because they are reacting to us, but rather to the message of the gospel. Let the gospel offend. Let us not offend because we're just offensive. But let us not compromise the gospel and let us understand that the gospel is an offense because the gospel says that we're all sinners and the gospel says we're all deserving of hell and the gospel says we can't save ourselves and we're not good. And frankly, to anyone who has a speck of self-righteousness, that's an offensive message. But let us also hasten to add that the God who is good and who is holy has offered to us a free salvation through the work of His Son. Now, the one who has the sharp double-edged sword says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Satan is alive in our city too. He's active through his demons in every city. But what the, what the Lord Jesus is telling the church here is, I know what you're going through. I know the pressure that you face. I know the demonic powers that are railed against you. And I know that you have stood true. So he commends them here. Do you see that? He's not finding fault. He's saying, you've not denied my name. You've not turned away, even when it cost you your life. We don't know anything more about Antipas other than what's told us here. The church fathers don't have anything to tell us about him. We simply know from the account that obviously there was one individual by the name of Antipas who stood faithful and true when it cost him his life for refusing to turn away from his witness for Christ. And yet it says in verse 14, nevertheless... I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have there those who hold. You notice back there in verse 14, you have those who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Verse 15, Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them. And please notice the way it's stated. I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. It starts with a revelation of Christ, the one with the sharp double-edged sword. It moves on to an exhortation and an evaluation. Here's the evaluation. You've done well in that you've stood true. But what you're doing right now is you are allowing 
within the assembly those who are teaching contrary to the gospel and you're not standing against them. It is hard to stand against false teaching. It is not pleasant. It is one thing to stand against the world and its false message. It's another thing to stand within the church against those who are compromising the message and yet who we consider part of us. That's doubly hard. And he says, I hold this against you, that you have in your midst those who are holding to this false teaching, who are saying, it's okay to go to the temple. It's okay to offer the incense. Nobody means anything by it. It's okay to eat the community feast at the temple because nobody means anything by it. It's just what we do. It's really more about the community than it is about religion. But tied in with the worship of the false gods was sexual immorality and promiscuity. And so there were two things, idolatry and promiscuity, that were wrecking havoc within the church family. And what the rebuke is this, you have theirs who hold to this teaching. He doesn't say all of you are following the false teaching. He doesn't say all of you are following the godless example. But you allow it to be present without taking action against it. And taking action, which we call today church discipline, is hard. Now, we want to give time for people to repent. We'll see this in the letter to the next church. And we ought to give time for people to repent. Church discipline, when it needs to take place, in a stand against godless teaching or godless living, the action must be taken, but it should be taken patiently and definitively. But if it is not taken, it brings the reproach of Christ upon his own church. And Jesus said, I will take action. Do you see the warning? If you don't take action, I will. That is serious. As hard as it is for a local church to take action against false teaching or godless activity among its members, to not take action will be more damaging in the long run. But it's hard, isn't it? Especially when you're in a community where there is such antagonism to the gospel, when you're already under attack. When you value everyone who names the name of Christ, to take action against any of them just seems so hard. And yet the scripture makes it clear, it is necessary. We never rejoice when we have to take church discipline action. But we do so for the same reason Jesus takes action. Because he loves us. Never forget that. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And if discipline takes place in the body of Christ, it is because we love too much to ignore godlessness. The Lord goes on to say, He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Now again, contrast this with the idolatrous feast where everybody is gathered together and the plates are full and the gods of Rome are worshipped. And the temptation is to go along so that you can increase your profit through your business in the city. Jesus promises hidden manna. 
It says there earlier, back in verse 14, that the essence of the false teaching in the church was that promoted by Balaam. Do you remember Balaam? The one who said he was a prophet of the Lord and had a good line. I mean, he sounded like it. If you've read the story of Balaam in the book of Numbers, you know that he sounded almost right on. But he wasn't. He sounded almost right. I can only say whatever it is Jehovah says to me. Right? And uh, the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, if they come and they call you, go with them. Remember that? And what did Balaam do? He didn't wait for them to come and call. He just got up and went. And that's the whole business with the donkey. Balaam's donkey, you know, that crushed his leg and sat down and he got mad and he started beating it and the donkey talked to him, right? Said to him, what are you beating me up for? Have I ever done anything like this to you before? Have I ever been uh, difficult to get? No, he said, have you ever thought about the fact that Balaam is talking to the donkey? <laughs> no, you never have. <laughs> and then he sees the angel of the Lord with the sword in his hand. And the angel of the Lord said, if the donkey hadn't stopped... I would have killed you. Guess who was smarter, the donkey or the prophet? But what was Balaam's whole point? Well, if you read the rest of the story, and you've got to read the whole book of Numbers to get it, you read the rest of the story, what you discover is that Balaam went along, but he really wasn't. He was an imposter. He was an imposter. And he went along because he wanted to make money. He wanted money. He wanted profit, and he thought he could somehow put together his role as a prophet with profit. He could use his gifts, supposedly, to put more gifts in his wallet. So he went along, but he, he couldn't do what the king wanted him to do, and the king got more and more ticked off at him. But if we read the rest of that chapter in Numbers and move on to the next one, we discover as you put that together with the book of Jude and the book of 2 Peter and this passage in Revelation, you put all of those chapters together, all five, and you get the bigger picture of what Balaam did. What Balaam did is he couldn't, because of his fear of God, curse the people of Israel. He figured out a way to get God to curse them. He said, listen, if we can just get them to worship idols, you won't have to curse them. God will judge them. So they got the most beautiful young women among the Canaanites to come into the camp and invite the young men to a feast, to the Baal of Peor, this false god. And they went along. And they committed sexual immorality. And they worshipped the Baal. And God's judgment came upon them. And thousands died. And Balak paid a large price to Balaam for his cleverness. You see what Balaam was after? Use religion to make a profit. Use religion to build your business. Use the church to promote yourself. And the two consequences were idolatry and immorality, false gods and godless living. Now, what the Lord Jesus promises to those who reject that teaching is this, hidden manna. You remember manna in the wilderness, same time, same time period, same illustration, Balaam, Balak, children of Israel in the desert. The manna, the food from heaven. Do you know what the word manna means in Hebrew? It's a question, manna. What is it? Because they all got out of their tents in the morning and looked around and said, manna? What is it? right, eat it. <laughs> it's manna. And that's the name that was given to it from that point on. Hidden manna. Do you remember how God told 
Moses to take some of the manna and put it in a jar and put it in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies, the most separated place where only the high priest could go only one day a year, the place of the presence of God himself. It was hidden manna. Now, Jesus says in John chapter 6 that he is the true manna, the bread from heaven. And so this illustration probably has several explanations. First of all, Jesus says, if you will remain true, I will bring you in to my temple and I will give you a feast on the bread of heaven. Contrast that with the idol feasts in the temple of Augustus. I will give you the hidden manna. It may also be a reference to Christ himself saying, you don't need to feast at the idol's temple. You can feast on me. Stay true. And then he says, I will also give him a white stone with a new name on it, known only to him who receives it. This is a special honor. The white stone has several possibilities. In those days, if it's referring to the culture of the day, judges used a white stone or a black stone at the end of a trial to declare whether or not the accused was innocent or guilty. And if a white stone was placed on the judge's bar, it meant the accused was innocent and all charges were dropped. This may be referring to that. It may be referring, however, to, if we're going back to the days of the Old Testament and the wilderness journey, to the Urim and the Thummim, the two stones in the breastplate of the high priest. When they would seek the Lord and ask him for his direction, the priest would use these two stones, the Urim and the Thummim, and the white stone. They were both identical in size and shape, so the priest couldn't tell one from the other. And he would reach under the breastplate into the pocket, and he would pull out one of the stones. If it was white, it was God's yes. That may be what it's referring to, that Christ will call us guilt-free, that we will get God's yes. Another thing that it could refer to is in those days and in that city where the Olympic Games uh, and, the, and the preparations for the Roman Games were very large, anyone who won an event was given on that day a white stone with an invitation on it so that they could go to the special victor's feast that was held at the end of the day. May also be referring to that. Where do I come down on it? I I prefer the image of the Urim and the Thummim because of the repeated images of the Old Testament wilderness wanderings. But in any case, all three would certainly be true. We would receive, for being faithful, God's yes declaration of his approval, an invitation to his feast. Now we have the church in Thyatira. We won't need much time here because the illustrations are very similar. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Again, it's the image of the righteous judge who sees all the way into the heart. And who stands with righteous feet, ready to judge. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. And that you're now doing more than you did at the first. You're more energetic. You're more involved. You're doing more than you did at the first. You're growing and you're making progress. Isn't this a wonderful approbation? Isn't this a wonderful encouragement? It is indeed. He knows where we live and he knows what we're doing. And he appreciates the faithful service of his own. Don't lose sight of that. He knows where we live. He knows the pressures we face. He knows the circumstances that surround us. He knows the godless age in which we live, and he knows the efforts we're making because we love him and we want to serve him. Nevertheless, verse 20, 
I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. The same two situations that we find in the previous church. I have given her time to repent. That's why I said church discipline should not be hasty. There should be time given for people to repent. Jesus said, I've given her time to repent, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her. And this uh, adultery, this false teaching is that it's okay to go to the temples. It's okay to participate in promiscuity. It's okay to offer sacrifices to the idols. It's okay to eat in the community feasts that are done in the name of an idol. He says, I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways, and I will strike her children dead. That is, her followers. Then all the churches will know, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Brothers and sisters, let us take this to heart. This is serious. What we do matters. It matters to Christ because you matter to Christ. And the decisions we make have an effect, not only on others, but on Christ himself. And he will take action. We are not the judge. Christ is. But when it's necessary for us to stand against false teaching or godless living within the assembly, we must make that stand. Christ gives it to us. That's what he says here. I have this against you, you tolerate. Do you see that? I hold this against you, you tolerate. He doesn't say you promote. He doesn't say you agree. He says you tolerate. You allow this to go on because you're unwilling to take a stand. I don't like church discipline, neither do you. But we love our Lord. And therefore, when a stand needs to be taken, it needs to be taken. Not because we consider others less worthy than we are. We're all sinners but because truth and the glory of Christ is worth everything. And to not take action is an indication that we do not love those who are led astray. We tolerate. Can we make this very personal? What do you and I tolerate in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own hearts that we know we need to take action on. I've been thinking a lot about this over the last several days. The sin of toleration. What I allow, not because I agree with it, not because I'm promoting it, but because I won't take action against it. I think one of the clearest examples of this in the Old Testament is found in 1 Samuel chapter 3, chapters 2 and 3. It's the priest Eli. Eli knew what his sons were doing. Eli knew that they were committing sexual immorality. They were abusing the offerings of God's people, and they were creating shame to the name of Jehovah in the tabernacle itself. Eli was upset with it, but he wouldn't take action and stop it. And you remember how the Lord spoke to Samuel and told him what he was going to do to Eli and to his family? 
And the next morning, Eli says to Samuel, you tell me everything that the Lord told you, and you tell me everything, or the Lord's curse will be on you. So Samuel told him everything. And do you remember what Eli's response was? You can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Do you remember Eli's response? Well, he's the Lord. Let him do what seems best to him. Do you hear that? Well, he's the Lord. Let him do what seems best to him. Look at that. You see what he's saying? Well, God will do what God's going to do. I'm not going to do anything about it. Why didn't he cry out? Why didn't he say, oh, God, please don't destroy my sons. God, please, I will remove them. Please show your mercy. Oh, God, I've been wrong. I should have taken a stand. I shouldn't have let this go on. But instead, he says, well, that's the Lord. Let him do what he's going to do. No, no. What does the Lord say? Repent. Repent. Take action. Turn to Christ. Stop. Do not tolerate what you know is sin in your life, in your heart, or in your home. He says, repent. Otherwise, I will come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I am he who will repay each of you according to your deeds. Verse 24, now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold over teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Look at this, hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will, does my will, to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. They have felt so controlled, so powerless, so impotent because of the culture and the country in which they lived. He said, you just hold on to the truth. You just keep living for me, and I will give you authority over the nations. The day will come when you will reign with me as kings. He will rule them with an iron scepter, dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I've received authority from my Father, and I will also give him the morning star. The morning star is the planet we commonly call Venus, the star that appears brightest just before dawn. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, Jesus calls himself the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Star. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 speaks about Christ's return as the day dawning and the morning star rising in our hearts. The image of the morning star is hope. The night is nearly gone. Sunrise is moments away. Hold on to the truth. Stay true. The pressure is great to compromise the truth, to follow the world, to pad the pocketbook, to allow and tolerate that which we know is displeasing to Christ. Repent. Hold on to the truth. And Jesus says, you will reign with me. And I'll give you the morning star. And I will fill your heart with hope and anticipation and you will no longer be a slave to fear. You will be a confident servant, eager for my return. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, these are hard things to hear, but oh so necessary in our day as well as in that day. And I pray that we will never compromise the gospel. We will remain true to the word and we will love one another, love one another enough even to enact church discipline when it's necessary, when false teaching or godless living overtakes a brother or sister. Help us to be patient. Help us to be gracious. Help us not to tolerate in our lives or the lives of our brothers and sisters that which is obvious and known sin. Give us compassion, but also conviction. And for ourselves, Lord, we pray that we would not tolerate in our own hearts 
anything that we know is displeasing to you. Oh God, let us not put off till tomorrow what we know must be done today. Give us renewed repentance and a hunger for your glory. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, 